Hello, and welcome to the One True Church. I'm Hugh Whitmore. Today I'm completing my series on Revelation Decoded with chapter 22, the last book of Revelation. And if you've been with me through this entire series, it's been a privilege and a, a great odyssey for me, and I hope for you too. Because Revelation is a synopsis of the Bible, but it's something more. It's a synopsis of our entire faith. But the problem with it is that you need to know the rest of the Bible to truly understand Revelation and what it can do for you. So dig into that Bible, learn the Old Testament, learn the Gospels, know what God wants you to do, and when you do, you'll know that Paul is false. And with all of this knowledge wrapped up together, you'll understand this most magical, mysterious, numerical book that teaches us exactly what we need to do for God. So stick with it. It's been a beautiful ride. Let's keep it going and finish it up today with chapter 22. 22.1 And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. You know, water flowing is a biblical metaphor for eternal life. The eternal river flowed in Eden in Genesis 2.10. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. And of course, in John 4.14, 4, Jesus said, But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. What a beautiful sentiment. And this eternal river then, of course, makes this return to us in the book of Revelation. And this also shows the three ages of time. In the first age, eternal life flowed and God was sovereign. In the present second age, the one we're in now, sin rules and God is not sovereign and eternal life is not flowing. Eternal life does not really become achieved for us until the prophecy of Revelation is fulfilled. In the third and final age, when this prophecy is fulfilled, God will be perfectly sovereign again. Two, in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there a tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. That's the number twelve again. It's a very important, magical, mystical, numerical number here in Revelation. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. That's us, the nations. In the church. Like the disappearance of Jesus in the Old Testament, the tree of life disappeared from the Bible story after Satan invented sin. Sin forced God to remove Jesus from the operation of his kingdom. Sin forced God to remove the tree of life. Sin is a negative force that drains eternal energy out of God's kingdom. And notice that the tree in this scripture here in Revelation borders the eternal river where the tree takes its sustenance. Three, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. The servants have been serving God all the way through Revelation because the servants, that's us, empower God to make this prophecy come true. And the curse is Satan's theft of this world and how we're living under this awful sin regime. Four, and they shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads. Throughout the Bible, it was said that no man could see God and live, yet men, many men, saw God and lived in the Bible story. And so what we've learned in Revelation, in this last great book of our great faith, is that this means that no man may see God in his fully glorified form and live, because that would just be too powerful for us. And here in the eternal kingdom, we, the saints, will be able to see God's face because we too will be in our eternal bodies just like God. And once again, it mentions how his name will be in our foreheads, just like the mark of the beast, which is a, not a good mark. Now it's the mark from believing in Paul. His name on our forehead is just figurative language for how the indelible internal knowledge of God's eternal word will be just burned into us. These marks are not literal. Five, and there shall be no night there, and they shall need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God give them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. 
All glory and revelation in the end of the world at the fulfillment of this prophecy has returned to God, and His presence is adequate to light the entire eternal city. 6. And He said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent His angel to show His servants the things which must shortly be done. It was supposed to be done shortly in this incredible prophecy and within three and a half years by the narrative of the book. But Paul interrupted it, which is why if we fight for God as a church, we can bring it back in the short time frames he's mentioned here in Revelation. 7. Behold, I come quickly. This is Jesus speaking, of course. Blessed is he that keeps the sayings of the prophecy of this book. When the prophecy is fulfilled, Jesus will come quickly. There won't be any time to repent, so do so now. The book of Revelation has power in it, just like the book of life that's mentioned in Revelation. That's why we're so blessed for learning this revelation and acting on it. And of course we're blessed. We're rewarded by God for our efforts in earning our salvation, because in doing so we glorify Him and empower Him to recapture His stolen kingdom. 8. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. 9. And then he said unto me, See, thou do not do it, for I am your fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, and worship God. The angel is just like us, a servant from God for the sake of our spiritual energy that glorifies God. This also is a reminder to not worship anyone other than the one true God, and that all of God's created beings are in this job together. We're all pulling together for this outcome in Revelation 10. And he said to me, Do not seal the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. You know, it's amazing to know that God has waited to create the conditions shown in this book of Revelation for 2,000 years. He gave clear instructions, and I believe the people of that time followed the instructions. But the power of Paul's twisted words and his false testimony turned out to be so great that God's will has been thwarted for this great time period. 2,000 years, two millennia. You know, my guess is that the people of that time of the Bible understood the spiritual nature of the Bible, which is why Paul's false testimony is so esoteric and twists the spiritual nature of the Bible into something it isn't, which leads believers astray and still does to this day. 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. You know, God's pointing out here that the whole world is not needed to fulfill this prophecy, just the faithful remnant. So those of you who are holy, please remain holy. If you're being filthy, if you're not being holy, please turn your life around, repent. Come to the one true God. 12. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according to as his work shall be. One final rejection of the false testimony of Paul. It is by works and not by grace that we are saved and delivered to eternity. And by the way, for you Paulines, if Paul is so important to the Bible, and if he is so greatly loved by God, and such a great apostle, why didn't God give the revelation at the end of the world to Paul instead of John? It's obviously a rhetorical question just for those of you who are mired in the Paul deception. Because Paul is false, and Paul is one of the three main people or entities that in Revelation are judged and destroyed into the great lake of fire. 13. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. That's another mention of the three ages of time. The beginning where God had complete sovereignty over his perfect eternal kingdom. The middle age of sin where we're in where God is not sovereign. And the final age that will come when the church fulfills this prophecy and the kingdom returns and God is perfectly sovereign again. 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Once again, we earn our salvation and reap a great reward. The Bible is a book of rewards and punishments. 15. For without, that means outside of the kingdom, are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loves and makes a lie. 
Paul loves and makes a lie, and he turns you into a liar if you believe in him. Please don't fall for it. 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Jesus is returning to his position as the bright and morning star. In Isaiah 14, 12, Lucifer is spoken of in this way. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn. Which shows that in this middle age of time, Lucifer has this great power. He is the morning star at this point. It's painful for us Christians to know that Jesus is supposed to be that. And Lucifer is in charge of this world and has suppressed the power that Jesus needs from the church to return to his lofty position as the bright and morning star. Yet here in Revelation, we have a perfect instruction as to how we, as the church, can glorify God adequately to return Jesus to the status of the bright and morning star. 17. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that hears say, Come, and let him that is athirst come. And whoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Here we see the mercy of God being shown, where all who obey the difficult teachings of God and Jesus will be allowed to enter the kingdom, which is another reason we know Paul's testimony to be false, and his fake grace is a lie. God has always been merciful, and grace was a twisting of something real, God's mercy, into something magical, grace, which people like, you know, because most people are lazy. They don't want to do the hard work God requires of us. 18. For I testify unto every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. 19. And if a man shall take away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. There's no need to add or subtract from Revelation once you know the story. Just obey the commands, understand the imagery and the metaphors, worship God in the way he needs you to, and bring Jesus back forever. 20. He which testifies these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. 21. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And here we are in the last chapter, 21 verses. That's 7 times 3. 7 is the fully glorified number of God times 3. Anything multiplied by 3 has great power in the Bible. And that's what we're left with here in this beautiful numerical book that tells us there's some exact amount of number of our works that is going to add up to this power that will empower God to fully glorify Jesus and send him back to come rescue us from this horrible, sinful world. And as some last words, I'd like to say this. When I read Revelation all the way through, I see a love story with a happy ending. God's first love, Israel, turned evil and turned against him. But we, as the one true church, came to God's rescue when he sent Messiah Jesus to lead our hearts into the proper direction. We treated God like he wanted to be treated. We obey him and only him. We love him enough to recognize the liar and the false apostle Paul. We stayed in love until the marriage was arranged for us and we went to live happily ever after in eternity as the bride of Christ.